Okay, let's get started. We are approaching the finish line in this course and in this lecture we are meeting the celebrated overlapping generations model which is very frequently and very commonly used uh, for studying a wide range of uh, diverse problems. Uh, as we will see, these overlapping generations models are usually uh, atypical, so we have special cases only. Uh, so in this lecture, following uh, chapter 17 of the textbook, we are going over some, uh, some approaches that may turn out to be useful when it comes to solving an overlapping uh, generations model. So first of all, uh, let's, uh, let's see uh, what an overlapping generations model is. Uh, this is a special case. This is, a, this is a, an interesting uh, family of models because in such an economy, individuals optimize so it is built on individual optimization but this optimization uh, doesn't bring the economy as a whole into a Pareto optimal uh, allocation so let's see some details in each period n individuals uh, are born uh, they live for two periods uh, in the first period they work and they sell the production to the contemporary living old generation. Uh, in each period, n individuals are born. So the population is always 2n, where n, this is very important, n is infinitely uh, countable. This infinity is the key to Pareto improvements as compared to the competitive equilibria. Uh, as I have just mentioned, and as I will show you in the next slide, each young agent sells its production to a retired S worker, each to one. Okay, so uh, the optimization in the optimization problem, the worker tries to find an optimum labor supply, uh, hence uh, an optimum output or production, hence consumption next period, because uh, Consumption when old is financed out of his income that uh, comes from uh, sales when he was young. Uh, utility is measured with a two variable utility function. This is the, this is the famous uh, von Neumann Morgenstern utility function. Uh, we will review it in the next slide. Um, there is a distinct part that measures the disutility, disutility of working and a separate part that measures the utility of consumption. Uh, following its preference system, the agent finds his own optimum. So we can find, this is the point, we can find a competitive uh, equilibrium. The government can redistribute, however, uh, because of we have uh, infinitely many agents. Suppose that young individuals are numbered and that the old are also numbered. So the whole population is ordered into pairs. So for instance, uh, young agent one sells its production to old agent one. Uh, young agent 2 sells its production to old agent 2 and so on. So um, when we have a competitive uh, equilibrium, uh, the government can make Pareto uh, improvements. It's very simple. Suppose that the government uh, gives the production of young agent 2 to old agent 1, so actually, old agent one owns the production of two young agents, and this creates a gap. And to fill this gap, 
uh, the production of uh, young agent three goes to old agent two, uh, young agent four, the production of uh, young agent four goes to old agent three and so on. And given the fact that we have infinitely many agents, we never reach the end. So we won't have an old agent with no, uh, no, no consumption. So this is a pure improvement. So the allocation, which was a competitive equilibrium based on individual optimization, it wasn't Pareto optimal. So the first welfare theorem is violated. Uh, um, this is a very, this was a very simple and brief summary of the problems underlying um, the use of the two welfare theorems in overlapping generations uh, model. The point for us, the point is that uh, competitive equilibria in an overlapping generations model of this kind, uh, competitive equilibria cannot be studied uh, from the social planners uh, approach. So uh, in this lecture, we will go over some facts, some very useful uh, approaches. But first of all, in the next slide, uh, we will build that basic uh, overlapping generations model that uh, Stokey and Lucas used uh, in that textbook. And after that stage, we will go over the four possible uh, solution strategies. Okay, so let's start building uh, our basic overlapping generations model. The basic unit in our model is uh, the individual who lives for two periods. In the first period of his life, he is young and works. And in the second period, he is old and retired and consumes. When young, the agent produces a commodity that he sells to the contemporary living old generation for money at the market price and out of his income in the next period of his life, so when he is retired, uh, out of his income he finances consumption in the second period uh, of his life. The utility function is uh, quite special. This is the so-called, this is a two a variable utility function, the so-called von Neumann Morgenstern utility function. Uh, we have two separate parts uh, in this utility function. The first part measures the utility or disutility of, uh, of work, of the labor supply, and the second part measures the utility of consumption. There is uh, an exogenous random technological shock affecting production. So this is the production function. This is the production function in which L stands for the labor supply, as I have just mentioned, and X is the uh, technological shock. Um, there is a money stock that agents use for selling and buying the only one commodity and moreover uh, workers keep their savings in this uh, in this money stock uh, we also know that the random shock comes from a closed interval and on this basis Equilibrium has two components. There is a price function that is strictly non-negative. And there is a labor supply, an equilibrium labor supply, uh, where X, the exogenous shock, is the, is the only one state. So, the equilibrium can be characterized by two equations. One is the optimizing uh, labor supply, 
So once again, the agent tries to optimize, maximize its uh, utility function. We will have a closer look at this function in a minute. So this is the first equation. And the second equation, as we will see, this is the equilibrium of the commodity market and the equilibrium at the same time, it is the equilibrium of the market for, uh, for money. So um, I guess this is the part of the utility function that deserves special attention. So in period one, in period one, the agent produces a certain amount of commodity. This is real production. This is real production. Uh, the agent sells this commodity stock at the market price. This is the current market price. And uh, this is the nominal, we don't need the quotation marks, this is the nominal or money value uh, of production. I wouldn't want to use money value, nominal value of production. So this is his uh, savings. Savings before retirement. Okay, and out of his savings, his income, the agent, when old, can buy this amount of commodity in the second period uh, of his life. So this is consumption consumption when old. So actually, uh, this part of the utility function that I hi highlighted above, this is the utility of consumption when old. Okay. So this is equation one and equation two, as I have just mentioned, this is, uh, this is the equilibrium of the commodity market and the money and the market for money. Okay. Um, assumption after having all this in the bag, assumption 17.1, uh, in this assumption, we clarify the basic characteristics of the two parts of the uh, utility function. Uh, we also clarify that labor supply must be in this half open interval. So there is an upper bound um, on the labor uh, supply. And of course, there is a lower bound, so labor supply cannot be negative. Okay. Um, and after this stage, in exercise 17.1, we add that uh, the labor supply must be strictly positive, so it cannot be 
cannot be zero, the optimum labor supply. And most importantly, in this exercise, we derive the first order condition for this uh, overlapping generations model. It's gonna be very nice. So it it's worth the trouble. Okay, and it's easy to realize that this is why production in period one. Okay, we will use this in a minute. Um, by following the instructions of the textbook, we can easily get to equation three, which is a tricky form of this first order condition. So by using equation two, the market clearing condition, uh, we could cancel out the price function. So what we have is an equation in which n, it can be solved in terms of the optimum labor supply. And uh, this is this is production next period. This is also production next period. So this part of the equation can be summarized in this way, which looks really nice. Uh, this is the core equation uh, of the problem because uh, we are looking for a measurable function n x that satisfies uh, this equation. Okay, and if we can find uh, this solution to the first order, this version of the first order condition, then, so after finding the labor supply, we can easily find the equilibrium price function on the basis of the market clearing uh, condition. And finally, this pair describes uh, stationary stationary competitive equilibrium. So this is what we are looking for. Okay. Um, all right. Let's uh, try to work with equation three. Let's try to introduce two further functions, zeta is uh, a function such that it stands on the left hand side of the equation and phi is the other equation. We are just simplifying uh, equation three such that the right hand side of the equation can be simplified. So on this basis, we have equation four which is a 
more comfortable form. We are still working with the same equation, which is simplified further by the use of, uh, of these new uh, equations. Um, so our problem is to solve this equation in terms of an optimal labor supply. Um, it's very important that the problem changes in terms of our assumptions. The problem changes uh, in terms of assumptions regarding uh, the random shock. In the first case, x, let's assume that s, x, the technological shock, is uh, iid. In this case, uh, equation 4 is uh, even simpler, this is n, it is even simpler because uh, x has no role in predicting the shock next period. So what we are looking for is, uh, is a number, n, that satisfies uh, this uh, equation. Uh, so given the fact that x has no role in predicting uh, the shock next period, uh, x doesn't show up uh, on the left, so it cannot show up uh, on the right as the argument of the labor supply uh, function. Okay, so uh, in this case, solution, solution a strictly positive number n. Um, in this case, we are supposed to show uh, uniqueness, existence and uniqueness, and this is what we do in, in, uh, in proposition uh, one. Okay, in the second case, in the second case, x is not iid, and uh, here we have four, so we need to work with uh, equation four, Okay, and uh, to simplify further, let's introduce a new function. This is the optimum solution to the problem. And uh, of course, from this, it follows that the optimum labor supply is given by the inverted function. This is very fruitful as an approach. Uh, this is doable because zeta is a surjective function. Uh, so in this case, the solution can be written in this way. And it, it is starting to look like an operator. And this is what we are trying to call into play. So this is a fruitful approach because uh, this, okay, so this is the solution, which you can see is a fixed point uh, of the problem. So if it is a fixed point, uh, 
the solution is a fixed point, then try to set up an operator by which we have the hope of uh, finding the equilibrium, the optimum solution with a simple iteration. Okay, so this is the final equation. Uh, and this is doable because uh, zeta is a surjective function. So its inverse is also a surjective function. So this is doable because on the basis of this function, we can infer the optimum labor supply. Uh, and the solution is going to be unique just because uh, zeta and its inverse uh, both are surjective uh, functions. So our task is to find to find the fixed point of this operator and uh, to do so we can follow four available strategies and in the rest of this uh, lecture uh, we will go over these options these possibilities these strategies so let's go over them one by one okay so let's go on we have just seen that uh, an equilibrium of the overlapping generations model uh, can be found found by finding a fixed point uh, of the operator 9 and uh, we have four available strategies to find uh, this fixed point contraction mapping crm is one of them first of all the use of the contraction mapping theorem is uh, is fruitful because uh, by the use of the contraction mapping theorem we can show existence and uniqueness of the solution of the equilibrium while in the remaining two cases we have two additional fixed point theorems which we will go over right away so in the in the second and third available strategy um we at the bottom line we can we can only demonstrate existence and showing uniqueness is another not this thing but another and related uh, problem um, the problem is uh, that demonstrating uniqueness by the contraction map mapping theorem has a price so uh, we have uh, quite strong an assumption, quite demanding an assumption uh, regarding uh, this uh, derivative of uh, our function. Okay, let's see the details. So we have uh, the operator, operator 9, in the general form. We created function g. Please note that we have a function f in the third variable. Uh, and uh, we create a set as the range of functions. So uh, and these functions uh, between x and d, uh, they, these functions form uh, a subset of con uh, continuous and bounded uh, functions. So um, function g is special. Uh, in the third variable, its domain is d, and its range is also uh, d. Um, by exercise 17.2, we can show that uh, the function which is created by an iterative step, uh, its range is D. So uh, the operator maps from F to F. So F, uh, the subspace of continuous and bounded functions, which we are interested in, it is a complete metric space. This is really, really important in terms of the convergence properties of the operator because 
uh, any fixed point of the operator must be uh, in F. Lemma 17.1 is key because it shows that our operator is a contraction if and only if uh, the slope uh, of the uh, uh, of function g in its third variable uh, is bounded and uh, exercise as the next step uh, exercise 17.3 shows that the model fails to satisfy uh, this condition <coughs> sorry so uh, what what to do now we want to use the contraction uh, mapping theorem but in this form in which we are trying to use uh, our operator it's not a contraction so we cannot we, we cannot uh, rely on the contraction mapping theorem so the idea that the the textbook suggests is to take the operator in a logarithmic form so we have another operator we have another uh, function space we have another domain uh, which which can easily be calculated from the range and the set uh, we previously worked with uh, the idea is suggested by a simple fact that um, um, we have a, a criterion in terms this is a restriction on the derivative of g in the third variable and if we use the operator in the logarithmic form uh, it's it's sloped the right hand side slope in the third variable is the elasticity of, of our function and given the fact that we created g uh, with the use of uh, uh, phi and zeta, our functions, uh, hopefully we can uh, constrain uh, its, its uh, slope on the basis of the elasticities of phi and, and zeta. So uh, exercise seven, in exercise 17.4, uh, we do the necessary uh, work so we realize that our new operator maps into a complete metric space this is good so we have the chance to find a fixed point in the same space as we are interested we are interested in uh, so uh, the result is that we satisfy all the conditions underlying the contraction uh, mapping theorem and most importantly by using uh, the two alternative operators, we can find the same uh, fixed point. And in proposition two, finally, in proposition two, we show uh, that the contra con contraction mapping theorem works. So the existence and the uniqueness of the uh, labor supply, the equilibrium labor supply on the basis of lemma 17.2 uh, can be demonstrated uh, um, we can show we show in proposition 2 that our operator satisfies uh, this uh, this uh, this criterion so once again uh, we can use the contraction mapping theorem if we use the operator in a logarithmic form and if we are ready to use a quite strong assumption regarding our function on the right hand side of the operator. The second available strategy is the use of Brewer's fixed point theorem, which is available if we have a finite number of states. And function f, in this case, the function f takes the form of a vector assigning distinct values to each uh, distinct value to each uh, distinct uh, state uh, so we have in this case we have the operator in a special uh, form so this is a weighted uh, uh, average the range of g is still d uh, which is also the range of the function uh, f so f capital f i mean 
the space of functions uh, is defined on the basis of this set D. Um, so in proposition three, we need to find an appropriate interval D uh, to define uh, the space. Uh, and this is done in proposition three uh, on the basis of the characteristics of function phi, the outer function uh, in G. Uh, in the second bullet point, I try to show you specifically uh, our operator in work. So you can see that it's, it's a weighted uh, average. Uh, what I have described is the first element uh, in the new vector, tf. So tf is a vector assigning distinct values to all the distinct values uh, of x. Um, the, as the range of g is d, and as this is uh, a weighted average, then tf uh, is going to be in d. Each element is going to be uh, in D. So the new vector is going to be in the appropriate subspace of continuous functions. And uh, the operator works properly. So we create functions uh, in, F, in F from functions uh, in F. So uh, all in all, all the prerequisites of Brewer's theorem are satisfied. So we can use Brewer's fixed point theorem to show the existence of, a, of an equilibrium uh, labor supply. Note, and this is very, very important, that uniqueness was not even studied on the Brewer's uh, fixed point theorem. So the most we can do is to demonstrate uh, existence. If we want to demonstrate uniqueness, as we will do in the final slide in this ex in this in this lecture so if we want to demonstrate uh, uniqueness we need additional assumptions which are quite demanding almost uh, almost uh, the, the same demanding uh, as uh, as the necessary assumption underlying the con uh, contraction mapping theorem let's go let's go to uh, Schauder's fixed point theorem. The next available strategy is Schauder's fixed point theorem, which is an extension of Brewer's results to infinite dimensional state spaces. Practically, such an infinite dimensional state space is a subset of the L dimensional Euclidean space. And as before, we work with the space of continuous and bounded uh, functions on X, uh, the exogenous uh, state space. A prerequisite underlying shoulder theorem is equicontinuity, which is the uniform continuity of, uh, of uh, all the functions in family uh, F. This is the criterion we are going to use to show that the functions we create with the use of the operator or equicontinuous, so all the functions we create are supposed to be uniformly uh, continuous. We have a couple problematic, uh, we have some problematic assumptions, as I've mentioned, uh, underlying the shoulders, uh, shoulder fixed point theorem. I like to highlight uh, prerequisite two and three, the mapping must be continuous, which we are supposed to show and the family of functions uh, that we create with iteration, uh, mu they must be equicontinuous. Uh, if all these prerequisites are met, then the operator has a fixed point. And just like before, in the case of Boover theorem, uniqueness was not even problematized. So uniqueness, the, the demonstrating that we have a unique fixed point uh, is a different but related uh, problem. Lemma 17.4, if five, sorry, in Lemma 17.5, we show that uh, 
any function we create with the operator, uh, um, the difference between two functions in terms of two states can be made arbitrarily small by uh, by reducing the difference between two states. This is the usual definition of continuity. So uh, the family TF is, is equicontinuous. Um, please note that uh, underlying equicontinuity assumption 17.3 is key. That means uh, difference between uh, between the transition function related to two distinct states measured in the total variation norm which was introduced on page 339 as you may remember the total variation norm is a norm in which we can uh, look for the highest value of a measure of a probability measure of a sign measure um, with uh, with uh, uh, a partition so we we in in the total variation norm we find a per partition that uh, uh, gives the highest value to uh, to a measure yes uh, this equicontinuity was not needed under the contraction uh, mapping theorem uh, and it was evidently held. It's it's quite easy to to show that equicontinuity uh, is held under Brewer's theorem if G is continuous. Uh, this is because we worked with weighted uh, averages, and if phi and the inverse of zeta they are if they are continuous then uh, family TF must also be equicontinuous. Um, exercise 17, in exercise 17.6, we show that the operator is, is continuous. It's a very nice exercise, so I strongly recommend you to complete uh, this exercise. Uh, just like previously, uh, we can refer to the continuity of function uh, phi and function and the inverse function of, of zeta. Uh, so, so given the fact that G in general uh, is continuous in the third variable, we can make the difference. Uh, we can make the difference arbitrarily uh, small in terms of. Uh, of the difference between uh, between two functions f f n and f and finally in proposition four we show that shoulder theorem applies to the overlapping generations model and finally let's turn to the fixed points of monotone operators uh, i have mentioned to you that uh, there is a difference between the use of the contraction mapping theorem and the fixed point theorems by Brewers or, or Schauder. Uh, the contraction mapping theorem ensures existence and uniqueness. So if we can use the contraction mapping theorem, we can uh, make it sure that we have a fixed point which is uh, unique. So existence and uniqueness are equally demonstrated. At the same time, the fixed point theorems that we reviewed above, they ensure existence only. So if we want to make it sure that we have a unique fixed point that we have found with uh, the use of the two one of the two fixed point theorems, we need additional uh, assumptions. Please remember that the price of uniqueness under the contraction mapping theorem was quite high because we needed a very demanding assumption regarding uh, the preferences. Um, so but all in all, the, the contraction mapping theorem ensures uniqueness. 
At the same time, when we use the fixed point theorems, we might find uh, multiple uh, fixed points. So uh, we don't want to have multiple fixed points if possible. So let's have an additional uh, assumption. And this additional assumption regards the monotonicity of, uh, of the operator uh, T. Um, we will define uh, monotonicity of T in a minute, but first let's see lemma uh, 17.6. Uh, if we have a sequence of functions that converges point, point wise, then the limiting function is a fixed point uh, of the uh, of the operator. Uh, so we have a problem here. Uh, we required the sequence of functions to converge pointwise, converge in general, but we don't know anything about how to ensure this convergence. Uh, and this is the point where we need monotone, um, monotone operators. The monotonicity of T, the operator, does the job. Uh, it's it's easy to to define monotonicity if you can see uh, if we have a distinct relation between two functions the operator preserves this relation between uh, the function on this basis CRM 17.7 uh, show it shows that a monotone operator on uh, function space F has a fixed point uh, in F, but here we have uh, another uh, restriction. The initial value of the convergence must be chosen that uh, uh, the sequence of functions is increasing or decreasing weakly. Uh, so we have further and further assumptions. Uh, the corollary of theorem 17.7 shows that if, and this is the point where uh, it's going to be interesting, if uh, the starting values F0 and G0 are the minimum and maximum elements in F, then uh, we have a special relationships, a special relationship between uh, the fixed points. So if F is lower, if F0 is lower than, than G0, then the fixed point uh, of the first convergence cannot be higher than the second, uh, than the fixed point of the second convergence. Uh, and if H uh, is a fixed point in between F and G with uh, the starting value between F0 and G0, then its uh, fixed point H must between F and G. So uh, in plain English, I would say convergence processes cannot cross uh, each other. It is very important because we are ready to, uh, to apply these uh, results. If F and G are two fixed points of convergence, starting from the minimum and the maximum, uh, and if it turns out that we find two fixed points for the two convergences and the two fixed points are equal, then there is no further fixed point between them. So, so uh, we find the unique uh, fixed point. So we, in plain English again, we must start two convergences from the opposite directions. And if we meet, uh, if these two convergences meet uh, somewhere uh, in between in the space, then, then we have uh, a unique uh, fixed point. Um, please note that the textbook gives you some practical suggestions regarding the, the use of, of the theoretical results. So, uh, we can uh, select F0 and G0 as the lower and upper bound on D. Uh, and following these steps, uh, if, we can, if we can show that the two fixed points we can find 
or echo, we have found the unique uh, fixed point. Uh, we have another uh, further assumption. This is assumption 17.4, which uh, regards preferences. And it's really similar to the one that we used under the contraction mapping theorem. So it's quite demanding. But at this price, we can ensure that we can have uh, a unique uh, fixed point. And finally, in proposition five, we show that under these assumptions, a fixed point of T is unique. Um, one question remains that regards the monotonicity of the operator, which comes from the inverse of zeta being strictly increasing and phi being increasing. So G is increasing in its third variable because this is the only criterion uh, which we need to ensure that we have a monotone uh, operator. In the final part of this chapter, Stokey and Lucas applies uh, these methods to uh, Lucas' seminal paper entitled Expectations and the Neutrality of Money. This is a very technical part uh, of the book. And I strongly recommend you to complete the exercises and that part uh, of the book, because on the one hand, this is a seminal, this is a path breaking paper and everyone interested in modern macro, I think he, he or she is supposed to be familiar with the basic results and, and the technical details uh, of this paper. This is on the one hand and on the other hand, uh, it's very great. It's a great experience to see that uh, that some basic uh, techniques in real analysis can be used to such advanced models. So hurry up and do the exercises and cover uh, the remaining part of the chapter, including uh, expectations and the neutrality of money. That's all for today.